Fish and I work as a wine for at the University of Melbourne Center for Cancer Research and I'm also a team member of Our Ladies Melbourne. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we all are. I am on the lands of the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation and invite everyone to reflect on the owners of their land from which sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, before we go into the details for today, in case you are wondering how you can participate in our events or you are interested in giving a seminar or a workshop, it could be a short talk, it could be anything if you would like to share with the audience, get in touch with any of the nice um, ladies here that we have. You can see the logo. I don't have it. I should have it. Uh, but um, everyone who has the logo as their background, you could get in touch. Um, you have many other resources as well. I would share how you can get in touch with us. But just before that, a big thanks to our amazing and faithful sponsors, CSL, um, Matrici from VHI, now Sendesk. So they have been providing us support in different ways while we were having in-person events. So things like uh, arranging the drinks and space and so on, that's not happening, but the still sponsors are with us. So we would like to thank them a lot for supporting us during these difficult times as well. So going back to how you can get in touch, uh, there are various ways. Uh, we have a Twitter page with Our Ladies Melbourne. Uh, that's our Twitter handle. We have a page on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Meetup. So there are various ways. If you are interested, you can get in touch with us. Before I give forward the event to Sevendi, um, October event is going to be very exciting. Dr. Amy Tanaka, who is a lecturer in statistics at Monash University, is going to talk about the art of design, software, and experimental design. So if you are keen to uh, hear more about it, please register for the October event, which we are going to publish soon after this event. So now for tonight, I would like to welcome Sev Wendy, who is an applied mathematician at RMIT mathematics department working in data science and analytics. She uses statistics, mathematics, and machine learning for her research. Her main research interest is anomaly and event detection. Examples are really interesting. So some of these are finding alien life on a planet far, far away and closer to home maybe, or a stock market crash. She also likes working on real world problems, especially ones that are motivated by the industry. So Wendy, we are really, really pleased to have you with us today. Over to you. Thank you, Sarish. I'm gonna start uh, sharing, the, uh, sharing my screen. Okay, and I'm going to talk about anomalies. Now, for a moment, suppose that after scanning the skies for years and years, one day we suddenly find intelligent life on a planet far, far away. Now, that would be super interesting, wouldn't it? This is an anomaly. We have been looking at the skies for quite some time, but, you know, we haven't really found... Uh, any aliens of uh, with intelligent life, uh, whatever that means, but this would be a really interesting anomaly. And you would want to know about this anomaly, right? So what kind of life forms are there? What kind of technology do they use? And what, what kind of mathematics, statistics, computer science, or what are their studies? How does their biology work? So you have lots of questions and all because this anomaly is super, super interesting. So, so why are we interested uh, in anomalies? So uh, the reason is that anomalies, like the aliens, they're telling us a different story, a very different story from the ones, the ones we know. For example, the fraudulent credit card transactions amongst billions of legitimate transactions. We have so many transactions going on today, like people are buying everything online, mostly because of the current situation, but even before that, lots of online transactions. And only a very small percent are fraudulent of these. Just like that computer network intrusions, we are always we are in some kind of network and occasionally there are intrusions. Or in as, uh, astronomical anomalies like solar flares, uh, maybe weather, weather anomalies like tsunamis, 
or even if you look at the stock market, there can be stock market crashes and there might be telltale patterns that are heralding this crash. So it's very interesting to uh, find these anomalies and to detect them and identify them early. So uh, you, can, you can think of, uh, uh, but do we, so the reason is why do we need anomaly detection? For example, if you take like fraud or network intrusions, something like this, uh, you can also train a model uh, on saying, okay, you, you can train and test a model saying these are fraudulent uh, data or these are network fraud and these are, these are good data. These are just standard network, uh, you know, people doing normal business. So these are the fraudulent calls that are happening in a network. So you can train a model and test. That is possible too, but there's a but. The thing is, there's always going to be new types of frauds, new types of intrusions, new types of attacks. So you will be looking for attacks that, that you, you know the signatures for. By doing a training and testing, like a classification problem, you wouldn't be able to find these new attacks. Right, because you're you're fixated on your previous signatures, your previous things that you're looking at, right? So you want to be alerted when weird things happen, and that's why anomaly detection is used in these applications to to detect the new attacks. So uh, in today's talk, I'm going to do an overview of anomaly detection. So I'm going to introduce anomaly, uh, talk about uh, unsupervised anomaly detection and how we evaluate anomaly detection methods and how do we compare two or more methods and talk about uh, the data repositories that are available. So feel free to interrupt at any time uh, uh, and ask questions because that would be really nice. Uh, uh, and then I'm going to talk about some new research. That is, I'm going to talk about this uh, an anomaly detection ensemble method uh, that uses item response theory. So, uh, so one of the most famous def definitions of an anomaly is the definition by Hawkins, which says an anomaly or an outlier is an observation which deviates so much from the other observations as to arouse suspicions that it was generated by a different mechanism. Uh, in, this, in this example that I've got here, we have, uh, these are the normal points, like the, the blue points are normal, uh, and uh, I've, uh, I've created five uh, points from a different distribution because, you know, due to our suspicions that it was generated by different mechanisms. So, so the, the five points come from a different normal distribution. And we, the job is in a way to detect them, right? Uh, so, there are many, many anomaly detection methods. So our uh, different co research communities have been interested in anomaly detection or outlier detection uh, for, for a long time. Statisticians have been interested in this problem for, for a really long time. Mainly their interest uh, kind of started from, uh, I guess, like, you know, when you, when you know which points are anomalous and then they're, they're they're skewing the model, they're making the model bad because the anomaly has a high leverage point and they're making the model bad. So you want to remove them. That was, that was uh, the kind of the original viewpoint of this, so to remove the outliers. Uh, but then later, outliers became interesting because they're saying something, uh, something different. And then there are the traditional computer scientists, uh, the, the traditional part of computer scientists are what I would like to call. Uh, they have also been doing anomaly detection for some time. More recently, the machine learning community with deep learning tools and uh, more, you know, recent uh, uh, methods, they've also been looking at anomaly detection. So basically, there are a lot of different people looking at anomaly detection. And when you look at, so there are several reviews, recent reviews available on the subject, and they have all different taxonomies. So there's no uh, globally accept, accepted taxonomy on anomaly detection. Sometimes people say, okay, there are the statistical methods and the machine learning methods. And then people say, oh, there are the nearest neighbor methods where you, you talk about a neighborhood and find anomalies, density-based, distance-based, clustering-based methods, and then the deep learning methods. 
uh, when the uh, all reconstruction based methods, that is you, you reduce the data to a smaller dimension and get a smaller representation. And then you, from that data set, you, you go back to the original dimension and look at the errors in this reconstruction. If the errors are big, then that's an anomaly. So like auto encoders and so sometimes parametric methods, non-parametric methods. So there are heaps of methods available. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, there have been kind of two camps so far in, uh, in identity. So, so, so uh, one camp of people uh, like to identify anomalies. So HD outlines is an R package uh, by Wilkinson in, uh, uh, on CRAN. So, he, so this is an example of anomaly identification. So you're giving a binary label, it's a one or zero. So here, the red points, if we run HD outliers on that data set where those three and these two points are anomalous, uh, the HD outliers finds these three points. So it assigns the binary label one and for all other points, the binary label zero. Whereas the DD outlier package, which has many density and uh, distance based methods for anomaly detection, gives a score, gives an anomaly score for all these points. So this is like one of the methods in the outlier package, so KNN distances. Uh, so it, it gives the highest KNN distances for those points, and then, you know, those are the distances, and these have smaller distances. So, you know, the darker the shade, the smaller distances, the lighter the shade, the, uh, the, high, the, the higher the score. So, so, so then it comes to the question, should you identify an anomaly or give a score? How do you go about it? Uh, identifying anomalies, traditionally statisticians did that. They identified anomalies. They said that was an anomaly. But the, uh, so that was good to, to identify, but also one of the points is, uh, then you don't know which point is the most outlying point because there's no score. Like in this example, you have, this is an anomaly, this is an anomaly, this is an anomaly. By looking at it, we'll know this is kind of more anomalous than this, but because there's no score, we, we, don't, we, we don't know that. Uh, the give scores method, traditionally computer scientists started giving, uh, I guess they, they had scores. Uh, in there, um, so without identifying, but then when you don't identify, it's, uh, it, it's the user's responsibility to put a threshold and say points that have outlier scores or anomaly scores more than this threshold are anomalies. Right, so that's that's um, and and people who are using our algorithms are not statisticians or computer scientists. So that is kind of a, a putting a lot of a responsibility on the user. And so more recent methods, uh, people are doing both. They are identifying anomalies as well as giving scores, so people have access to both things. So. Uh, and the, the other thing is, okay, how would you evaluate an anomaly detection method? So can you use traditional accuracy, like classification accuracy? So in this example, we've identified, so let's look at the identifying scenario, identified three anomalies of the five anomalies. So these two we haven't identified. So we've missed two. So a traditional class, classification accuracy, we would, and there are 105 points all in. 100, 100 points uh, here and then five anomalous points over there. So of, of 105, we've, we've correctly, uh, we've, so all the 100 non-anomalous points we've identified as non-anomalous, so th that's 100. And this is the three that we've identified as anomalous. So 103 over 105 is a traditional accuracy measure coming, taking from classification accuracy. But there's a problem. If no anomalies are detected, okay, so then still our accuracy would be 100 over 105. Now that's a very high accuracy for not doing a good job, right? So you're not detecting a single anomaly, but you're getting an accuracy of 100 over 105. So the thing is, because these data sets are imbalanced, imbalanced you need other evaluation methods to evaluate anomaly detection. So uh, evaluation methods are, uh, there are two types. That is, if, you're, if we identify the anomalies, 
if you identify the anomalies generally, we can use a confusion matrix. Uh, we can use a confusion matrix, and then you have your predicted values, yes or no, and the actual values, yes or no, put the numbers there, and you can compute your true positive rates, or false positive rates, so of the, of the predicted values that are positive, how, what's the rate of true positives, false positives, or then there are other things, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, sensitivity, specificity, uh, precision recall, F measure, all these things are coming from the confusion matrix. So there are uh, lots of uh, measures that you can compute from the confusion matrix that can be used to evaluate your anomaly detection performance if you're in the job of identifying your anomalies. How about if you're giving scores? How would you uh, get the uh, performance of the anomaly detection method then? If you're giving scores, the way to go about is you, you're going to, uh, you know, mo the most popular things are the RO curve, the receiver operator characteristic curve, or the precision recall curve. So the ROC curve has the uh, false positive rate on the x-axis and the true positive rate on the y-axis. So in your data set, so you have the uh, you, you will have the labels, the actual labels, which are anomalous or not, because to evaluate you need to know the truth, and then you have your scores, right? You have your scores, and then you would go, okay, if you if you have your threshold here, what is the false positive rate and the true positive rate? And you will change your threshold and do this receiver operator characteristic curve. And the area under this curve is, a, yeah, is an evaluation metric. And so the higher the area, a better the anomaly detection method. So similarly, area under the precision recall curve is also an evaluation metric. So if you're if you're giving scores, then uh, then that's the, uh, the, the those are two popular methods to use. So uh, then comes the question: Okay, how would you compare two or more anomaly detection methods? Say, for example, uh, uh, one way that you can do is you can have several iterations. So in this case, we have this data in an annulus or in a donut shape, and our anomalies, which are which are coming from a different distribution, uh, are, are these uh, orange points, and they start here, and in each iteration they slowly move inside. So this is so there are ten iterations. So this is iteration ten where they're totally inside. This is iteration five where there's somewhat inside, right? And then I'm using, what I'm using is I'm using three methods from the DDR5 package. All of them are scoring anomalies. They're scoring anomalies. Uh, so they're giving anomaly scores. And then what I do is for each iteration, I am going to uh, compute the area under the ROC, right? Which is called the AUC, area under the curve and I plot it for each different iteration. And what we see is, okay, if for this example, the green curve, K and N, uh, K and N increases with each iteration because you would expect the performance to increase because these uh, anomalies are moving to the middle. It should be easier to detect them, right? Uh, so you would expect the performance of the methods in iteration 10 to be greater than that of iteration five. And uh, so the uh, green curve, KNN and LOF, this is a local outlier factor, a different method, the, the, uh, uh, the score increases, the area under the curve. But COF, another method, it decreases, which is kind of strange in a way, but you know, so that method obviously didn't, didn't perform well for this example. So, so this iterative method, okay, you have a normal or it can be in an annulus or it can be in a normal population and the anomalies slowly drift off and uh, you, you can check with a couple of methods and see is it uh, beneficial, like in the sense, are the methods detecting the anomalies? So then comes the question, when you submit a paper or that, then there's always a question of real data sets. People want to know, oh, it's fine that you've got 
the uh, for the synthetic data, this method works. But what about real data sets? You know, we are interested in real data sets. So, uh, how how do you how how do you go about doing something for real data sets? So generally, what's done is uh, you take a classification data sets where you have two or more classes. And you downsample one class, you downsample the minority class and designate these as anomalies. So in, in this one, so this is a, a, a game simulated one, not exactly a real one. So the, there are two classes, the uh, blue uh, triangles and the orange uh, dots. And if I, if I downsample it, one downsampling might be like this. So I'm downsampling the blue dots. One downsampling might be like this. Now, this is a bit extreme, right? Because these blue dots, even though we designate them as anomalies, they're not really statistically, they're not anomalies, right? So, so that's kind of a bad downsampled data set. But when we do this for real data sets, we do get this sometimes. We do get downsampled data like that. Okay. And then this one, the one on the right, is a good downsampled data set because here these are away from the rest of the points. And then there, you know, so if you're evaluating our method on these, that's good. So that's a good data set, good downsample data set. So, so because there can be good downsampling data sets and bad downsampling data sets, uh, it's generally advised to downsample. So you have a source data set, a source classification data set, and to use many downsample data sets from the same source. Because occasionally, not very often, you will end up with a data set like this, right? And, and because of that, you need, if you have lots of downsample data sets, the, 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 data, the bad downsamplings would be small. Right, so uh, so that's how that, that's a that's a way of getting from a from a real from a classification data set how you would get a uh, uh, anomaly detection data set. So uh, there are uh, there, there are lots of uh, anomaly detection data repositories. So uh, the the KMesh repository uh, KMesh the the Rob Hyman came with the name. So uh, this is a repository that we did with the Rob, Case, with Miles, Mario, Andres, Munoz, uh, and myself. So th this has over 12,000 downsample data sets. Uh, the odds data repository, this is also a really good data repository. It has, uh, in addition to the normal IID data, it has time series data, and it has like you know, different types of data. And there's the Elki data set. Uh, which, which is also da downsampled. Like most of these data sets have downsampled classification data sets. And there's this data set, the Harvard data, data list data set, which has about uh, 10 data sets. And then there's these uh, other repositories as well. So there are anomaly detection uh, data repositories that people have put up there. Right. Now, so that's the end of the first part. If uh, people have questions, I'm happy to take them. Or if people want to stay, stay till the end, that's fine too. Can I ask one quick thing, Sir Bendy? Yes. So I was uh, wondering to score the anomalies, do we need truth data set always? Or it is possible that you could score the anomalies without a truth set? We, we, we can find it. So, thanks, Harish. I think I should have made it clear. So we, we, the anomaly detection methods, the unsupervised methods don't need the labels. We mm. just, we have just, we can, you can have just the data without knowing the labels, you can find anomalies. But the thing is, how do you know, uh, how would you know if the anomaly detection method is a good, uh, is performing well? To evaluate the performance you need to try it out on a data set where you have the labels. Hmm. So, 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 so uh, two things. So you don't need the labels for an, for an unsupervised anomaly detection method. So you, no need of labels at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to evaluate the method, to see if the method is giving you good results or not, you need to test it on a data set that has the labels. And is it possible then to um, train the anomaly detection method? 
uh, then that would be so. So there are the uh, the the. Uh, there are supervised anomaly detection methods where you are you give it data and train it uh, yeah. to to identify those anomalies or you know to to get the boundary uh, that way. So those are more supervised anomaly detection methods. But we are more talking about uh, today on the unsupervised, unsupervised ones. Sounds yeah. good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So. Uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, anomaly detection ensembles. So, uh, so why do we have ensembles? So, uh, anomaly detection has many applications, right? So, and uh, when we have many applications, obviously, uh, like you know, you want to minimize the false negatives, uh, false positives, and then also avoid false negatives. That is, you know, you want to catch every anomaly, but not catch too much so that your method is becoming an alarm factory kind of thing, right? So, uh, so you want ways to better identify the anomalies. And one way to go about it is just to have better methods. And another way is to construct an ensemble. That is, you're using existing methods to come up with better anomaly detection scores or predictions. Right, so that's the uh, uh, that's the sale of use of ensembles. So, uh, what would an ensemble look like? This is like a, this is one way that you can build an ensemble. So you have a data set. So this is this is a, a test data set in two dimensions, and you have unsupervised anomaly detection methods. So here I've uh, run this. Uh, so I've given uh, this data set to seven unsupervised anomaly detection methods. And these are the anomaly scores for these selected points. So there are seven selected points. These are the anomaly scores for those selected points. Now, the task is using these scores. So these are the scores. Using these scores, can we come up with an ensemble score? Right? So you have this uh, AD ensemble, which can come up with an ensemble score. The, the, these methods that I'm considering are called heterogeneous methods. That is, they're different methods, right? Different, different methods. So for example, uh, there are other types of anomaly detection ensembles as well. And uh, two, two methods are feature bagging and subsampling methods. So in feature bagging and subsampling, what happens is you, you find different, so you have a data set similar to the last time, and you select different features, right? So different subsets of features. So if you have like 10 dimensions used, you select different subsets of features. And, um, and then you, for each subset of the features, you employ your anomaly detection method, right? And then, uh, so you've got for each feature subset, you have your anomaly scores, and then you average all the anomaly scores and get your ensemble score. So that is feature bagging. And in subsampling, it is also similar. And what you do is, what you do is uh, instead of uh, sampling the uh, features, you sample the data points, especially if you have a massive data set, you would sample the data points, the observations, and use a single anomaly detection method and you know, get the features. And sometimes you put these two together, feature back against themselves. So the main difference with this method and the previous method is here we have one anomaly detection method. And it is uh, it is being used on different subsets of features or or observations, and then the score is averaged. Whereas in this one, we have a set of heterogeneous methods, and this is what uh, I'll be talking about today. So, what to to construct the anomaly detection ensemble? Uh, what we are using is item response theory. So what is item response theory or IRT? So IRT is a set of models that is uh, used in psychometrics or social sciences. So, for, so it's used in, uh, in many different things. For example, it's used in education. In education, so say you have a test paper. And then you uh, you want to know so uh, then um, so for the educators that are here today so you you want to construct a test 
that is discriminative. So, so you can easily construct a test by putting lots of hard questions in there. And that's no good because just all the questions are hard. But what you want to do is discriminate between the good students and the weak students. So, so there are methods uh, to, to find, to, to look at the results of the students for different questions and find these difficulties of test problems and discriminative ability of the test questions. And also IRT, what IRT also finds is the ability of the students or the ability of the participants. So in education, IRT is used for that purposes, uh, to find the difficulty and the discrimination of test questions and the ability of participants. In other social sciences disciplines, uh, IRT is used to, uh, to understand more about some unobservable characteristic by using observed outcomes. Uh, for example, racial prejudice or stress proneness. So you, you can, people can do a survey. And um, from the survey, you can see the spectrum of the people and understand the racial prejudices or in, in different stress situations, how people react uh, or po political inclinations uh, of people, like how left or right winged you are. So there's this intrinsic quality that cannot be measured directly. Like you can't just get from by talking to a person how politically left or right winged you are. So you, you ask a survey of questions and then you model it using IRT and then get this, it's, uh, it's from this latent trait, you get this intrinsic quality uh, that, is, uh, of you, that, that is of interest, right? So... In education testing, what we have is typically something like this. So we will have uh, many questions. I'll just put in four here, but many questions. And you would have lots of students, right? Uh, and these are the marks of the students. So uh, for each question, student one marks for question one, question two, uh, and so on. So this is the input matrix. That's your input. So N students, these are participants, answer simple N questions. Those are called test items. And your input matrix to the IRT model is, is this a matrix of marks, which are actually matrix of accuracies, right? It's an accuracy uh, of Y capital N uh, times simple N. And this is the input, you fit an IRT model. And when you fit the model, what you get, you get your output, you get three things. You get the student ability. So for each student, you get their student ability and that's, that's you get a latent trait continuum, right? So, so you get this conti continuum thing where your, all your, the ability of the students are kind of stacked together and there's an order. And then you get the, for each test item, you get the discrimination and difficulty parameter. And sometimes, depending on the model you fit, you might get, get a guessing parameter as well. So there are so, uh, different IRT mappings. In education, uh, what you have is you have these participants and doing these tests. So each participant does each test item. And uh, they do these test items and you get this matrix of derived scores. Right? So this cause, uh, we have this matrix Y uh, of capital N times simple N. So this is a matrix of derived scores. That is, they're the marks of the students, and that is the accuracy measure. This is an accuracy measure. Okay. And using this matrix, you fit the IRT model, and then you get the latent trait, uh, the student ability, and these other characteristics. Now, uh, in, other, uh, in other studies, like in, say, racial prejudice or, you know, uh, say, in Rosenberg's self-esteem scale, you have these statements. It's a similar pattern. What you have is these statements. I feel I'm a person of worth. And you have strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. These are what's called these Likert scales. So you, you have this scale and everyone ticks what they, what they feel like for each question. Uh, and then, so, so that way, this matrix is not marks. 
it's not uh, it's not a derived response or an accuracy measure. It's an original response, right? Because there's no correct or wrong answer, right? Uh, example, uh, like in this paper, they had they used IRT to explore stereotyping Roma people or gypsies in Italian. So uh, this uh, this. Uh, uh, a paper had statements like uh, they, they had a survey with statements like Roma people do not want to integrate and prefer to be marginalized, right? So, okay, and, and people click different things, right? P people say strongly agree, strongly disagree, whatever. So there's no, that you, you can't mark it and get an accuracy. So it's the sort of original responses that are used here. And what you get in the end, the latent trait is not an ability as such, it's, it's this underlying trait, the attitude towards Roma people, or the self-esteem of the participants, or something like that. So that's what the latent trait has, right? It's actually uh, more of a, of a trait uh, within you in that, uh, in that way. Of course, the ability is also a trait, but the main difference in education uh, is that you use these derived scores. These are the marks, uh, whereas these are original responses. So, uh, so that's what's traditionally IRT is used for, uh, but IRT has recently been used in machine learning. And this first work that I came across was uh, uh, by Martin S. Plimade paper, the 2019 paper, actually, to tell a bit of a story uh, about it, uh, Kate Smith Miles was uh, in one of her uh, seminars. She found this paper, and then she she went through that paper. So she presented that paper in the seminar. So what they had done in this 2019 paper, it was published in Artificial Intelligence, a really good journal. So uh, what they had done was they ev they used IRT to evaluate algorithms, uh, and then. Uh, later, so after Kate presented that later, I started working on it with Kate, and we have this, uh, uh, so we used IRT to, again, for algorithm evaluation, so we kind of extended this work, uh, and they, they, there is a preprint on that. Then, later, what happened was, uh, I was thinking about this, and I thought, hmm, but IRT can also be used to construct an ensemble, and, and especially an anomaly detection ensemble. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So when we are using IRT for anomaly detection to, to come up with an ensemble, what the way we do is we have observations as participants. So these are observations and there are these are the anomaly detection methods. We are talking about all um, unsupervised methods here. So the, the anomaly, so you have the observations and you have the anomaly detection methods, unsupervised methods, and then you get this matrix of anomaly scores. So that will be uh, again Y capital N times simple and matrix. So that is N is you have capital N observations and you have simple N methods. Right? So this is the anomaly scores. They're, again, they're not accuracy measures, right? They're not accuracy measures because that's just the output of the unsupervised methods. We haven't looked at the class labels. There's no accuracy involved, just the output of the methods, right? And we get this matrix and then we fit the IRT model. Now, when we fit the IRT model, what is the latent trait? The latent trait is the enormousness of the observations, right? As in a way agreed by all these different methods. Because, because see, when we did the attitude of the Roma people, the latent trait was the attitude towards the gypsies or your self-esteem. In this instance, you're having all the anomaly scores there. Right? Anomaly scores means unsupervised scores. So your latent trade is the anomalousness of the observation. So this, the latent trade, is the ensemble score. Right? The latent trade is the ensemble score. High values in the latent trade denotes high, uh, 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 high ensemble scores, high anomalousness, low values, low anomalousness. Right. Now, I've got a couple of slides with some equations. 
So what, what is the model? What, so we said, okay, we're gonna fit the IP model, but what are we fitting, right? So this is the equation that taken from this paper, Shijima in 2005, where F of Zij given theta i, so is the probability density function of getting an anomaly score, an anomaly score of Zij. So the anomaly score is Zij, for observation i by uh, method j, given the anomalousness of the i observation, right? If the, if the anomalousness of the i observation is theta i, z i j is the anomaly score, and f of z i j is the probability. So this is a surface of probabilities. Now, for each j, so remember i is the uh, observation, j is the method. For each J, we have these are fits. So the discrimination parameter of the J anomaly detection method, gamma is a scaling parameter of the J anomaly detection method, beta is a difficulty parameter of the J anomaly detection method. And what we have is, so the discrimination difficulty and the scaling are fixed for a method, right? So here, what we are having is, is a Gaussian for every theta R. Right, so if we uh, if we look here, in, in so this is the picture. The, this is the uh, uh, the uh, uh, like the the laser pointer kind of thing. And then here, if we have at theta equals, so the x-axis is theta, and y-axis is the normalized z-score. Uh, so z z i j is the y-axis. Uh, and for if we fix theta equals three then we are going to get, so here we have a, a normal uh, distribution for, for that curve, for theta equals to three. So for, for given theta, the probability, so for a given theta, so if this is fixed theta, if theta is equal to th three, this is our probability density function that we have. So this is the probability of getting our, our F of uh, Z, Z, uh, that, that is the, uh, getting the uh, score, anomaly score. So if our theta is equal to three, so theta is uh, the anomalousness of the observation. If we have high uh, uh, anomalousness, then the probability of getting uh, a high, uh, so the, the highest, uh, the, the probability of getting a, a Zij is highest at at there, right? When z i j is also equal to three. Of course, this this uh, dash line, this lightsaber is on y is equal to x. So uh, that kind of uh, uh, thing uses it. But but you see the the lightest part. So if the higher the theta, the higher the anomalousness. In this instance, your anomaly score, the most probable score, is a high score lower the anomalousness of the observation, your, uh, the most probable anomalous score is a low score, right? So that's what this is telling us. So this is the underlying equation. And what you fit is from that you're maximizing the log likelihood given by this particular expression, right? So this comes straight away by uh, um, taking um, products of this and taking logs. And of course, you get this other term because they have used in, in that paper, they have used this marginal maximum likelihood estimation, but that comes straight from that where the alpha, gamma, beta are just the same as before, alpha is discrimination and so on, right? Okay, so what you do is you maximize this log likelihood function, right? And then you, you so you're doing this optimization. You, you, you optimize and find your alphas gammas and betas. So Zijs are given and you, you do this optimization and you find alpha, gamma and beta. That's what you do, right? And then once you once it converges and once you find the alphas, gammas, so you'll find your alpha, gamma and beta for all J, for all different J, that is for each anomaly method, you'll find those parameters. Once you find that, then you can just put it in, you, you can, you can uh, find your latent trait parameters. The latent trait parameters are the ensemble score, 
right? They will give the ensemble score because the latent trait tells you how anomalous the points are. So you, you put into, into this equation, the latent trait just pops out easily after that, uh, after that uh, uh, optimization. So you have these alpha j squared, beta j, gamma j, zij divided by that sum. So where theta j is the ensemble score, this is what we want, this is what we're interested in. And uh, we have alpha is the discrimination, beta is the difficulty, and gamma is the, you know, the uh, scaling parameter. Zij is the anomaly score. So, uh, so we can use this to get the ensemble score. So, so the thing to note about here is that uh, the alpha, so he, here, uh, what we are doing is depending on the alphas and the betas and the gammas, our, our ensemble score is different. So what we are effectively doing is when we have lots of anomaly detection methods, we are, uh, we are focusing on the better ones and we are downplaying the noisy ones. Right, because the noisy anomaly detection methods might have low alpha j, and you're kind of downplaying those, and you're really uh, putting a spotlight on the more sharper anomaly detection methods. Right, so that's what this uh, this ensemble score uh, uh, computation does. So, to to uh, to do an example, so uh, what we are going to do is we have a data set, and this is the data set, this, uh, the annulus data set. These are the anomalies that are in the middle, and we have unsupervised methods. So we, we've uh, uh, I've taken these methods as the unsupervised methods to construct the ensemble, and all these methods, KNN, LRF, CRF, uh, all these methods are, uh, are taken from the DD outlier package which are nearest neighborhood based methods, uh, either using density or uh, distance there from the DD outlier package. And then I also tried auto encoders uh, and isolation forest taken from the H2O package and the one class support vector machine taken from E1071 package, right? So those are the anomaly detection methods, all unsupervised that I'm running on this. Then we will make the ensemble and then so the ensemble is the IRT ensemble and then we do the ensemble and get the ensemble score. So, so this is the unsupervised, this is like for some of the uh, data points, uh, unsupervised uh, outline detection method output for all those methods. So uh, the points 801 to 803 are the actual anomalies, and those are the scores given by different methods. You'll see that not every point, uh, not every method picks these points as anomalies. So high scores would mean they're considered anomalies. Low scores would mean they're not considered anomalies. So some methods uh, find these as anomalies, and some methods don't. So we'll, we'll put it to the uh, ensemble here. We have uh, uh, the, uh, we, we, so we have our matrix Y N times N. So these are all the anomaly scores. And then we'll put it to the IRT ensemble and then we get an ensemble score. And this picture is uh, the points are colored according to the ensemble score. Right, so they have so these re very red points are that that is saying the IRT has uh, got very high high points for those uh, high scores for those points, whereas the yellowish points they have low lower scores. So uh, that's what this says, and you can see that the IRT ensemble does a decent job. So then what we went was uh, okay, we want to compare this with other ensembles. Right, like you know, the standard ones that we have, like the average ensemble, or the, there's a greedy ensemble proposed by Schubert et al., uh, which, which takes greedy methods looking at correlation values. And then, of course, the greedy ensemble has a parameter called k. So, I also looked at okay, if you average it over different k, the greedy average, what would you get? And then there's an ICWA uh, method uh, from Chang et al. And then, of course, these max and threshold methods uh, that were mentioned in this paper by Agwal and Said, I, I looked at those as well. So just to compare with other ensemble methods. 
And this is what we got, the comparison. So, um, so as you can see here, so by looking at these methods, the ones that are yellowish, because we only have outliers in the middle, so those should be kind of reddish, everyone else should be of a lighter color. So the greedy uh, ones, which I ran with two different uh, Ks, the greedy ones, the greedy one and greedy two didn't really, or, or the greedy average, or the max, they're not so good methods because you see a lot of them. And what we want is only those ones in the middle to be there. The average method is actually doing very well, right? It's doing very well. But the, um, the issue is it's finding that point and that point to be kind of more anomalous than these points. Um, and whereas ICWA is doing the same. But IRT is actually doing a good job in this one uh, because uh, it's finding those uh, points to be highly more anomalous than the others. But generally, average uh, ICWA thresh are also doing well to this example for this one. But then what about our previous way of doing it, right? Can we do these iterations? So um, uh, iterations in the sense here, uh, uh, can we, you know, uh, can we have uh, th these uh, anomalies moving into the center with different, different iterations? So this is iteration five, where the anomalies are in blue, and they start off here, and they slowly trot into the middle, right, with each iteration. This is iteration 10, when there everything uh, are, is in the middle. And to make it slightly more complex, I added four more dimensions. So the data... Uh, I added uh, data in R6, uh, where these are the two first dimensions and the other four I haven't shown, but they're all normally distributed and there's no difference between the anomalies and the non-outliers in those uh, dimensions. And as the evaluation matrix, we looked at the area under the ROC curve. So these are the different iterations, as we can see, uh, most of when you start off, like when, so in first iteration, this point, these set of methods are way over here. Uh, they're, they're kind of, you know, all starting together. But as the iterations go on, uh, the, the gap between IRT uh, uh, ensemble and the other ensemble is, it is getting bigger and bigger, right? And the, the purple one is kind of a nice curve. That is, if you have, if you take the maximum instead of do this IRT uh, uh, business, that is also kind of increasing nicely. The others, the green one, it, it grows up and then it grows down, which is kind of uh, surprising in a way why that would happen. But, but we see as each iteration goes, so uh, that IRT is performing better. And, and to account for randomness, I ran each iteration 10 times, and these are the average results that we have. Okay. So the why, why IRT works better in these uh, instances is because of the, la the latent rate computation, it downplays the noisy methods and and kind of uh, weights more, the more sharper methods. And that's all coming from the latent rate computation. That's the reason. So uh, in summary, um, uh, I, anomaly detection have many applications and it's used in, uh, IRT is used in social sciences and psychometrics. So what I've shown today is this application of IRT to come up with an anomaly detection ensemble. And um, we've done, we've tested it on real data sets as well on this big repository, and we got good results. So the more details on the preprint and the R package that I made for this is called Outlier Ensembles. So underneath Outlier Ensembles, it uses this uh, IRT package called ESTCRM, but it needs to extend it in certain ways because the objective function that we are doing is slightly different. Uh, so I kind of used uh, my extension of that uh, underneath the outlier ensembles package, and this is on CRAN, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sir Wendy. It was such a detailed and informative talk. I 
I learned so much. It's, it is interesting how ensemble calling is also a concept in uh, bioinformatics. It's, it's really different, not so much statistics behind it, but basically if you call variants using different bioinformatics approaches, you could pick up ones that are called by, depends how many are there. For example, if there are three approaches you're using, so you can pick up, you can say that I'm going to pick up only variants that are at least called by two approaches to reduce the noise. So it was really interesting uh, to hear about your take on Ensemble. So thank you so much. I am going to open up to audience for questions. Um, so if anyone has questions, please ask either in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, hi, Sarandi. Um, so it was a nice talk, but uh, I just want to ask you a question, but bit a different kind of a question. So I was thinking, so like outliers could happen due to like, like in respect to different features. So one could happen based on one feature, one could happen based on all the features. So like, is there a way that you weight these kind of things? Like whether you could find whether it's happening due to one feature or whether it's coming from all the features? Yeah, sorry. That. So this is, uh, th there is another research part called subspace outlier detection, L like in the sense finding uh, wh what are the features that contribute to uh, outlier detection, L like in the sense, as you say, it, 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 there can be different, dep depending on the applications, you might have uh, outliers uh, like one one type of outliers coming like this in in one set and another uh, set of outliers coming in another uh, feature set. So so the the people looking at subspace outlier detection they are they're doing a lot of work on that. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, for for us for me I haven't uh, like you know done uh, much on subspace outlier detection at this point, but I'm interested. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sarita. I see Rahul has a hand up. Do you want to ask your question, Rahul? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, I do some outlaw detection on time series, uh, right? Just a nominee detection on either univariate series where you try to see pattern changes or then multivariate series where relationships break down. And uh, we use TS features a lot. And I can imagine that the first conversion is to translate either these multivariate series into TS features, which I think will formulate the input into this system and then look at how uh, the existing outlier detection methods um, find if, if some features have changed. Do, ha, have you tried applying this technique to time series and do you have any insights on that? Yeah. So the the uh, so when so there is a uh, okay. So firstly, there is a, 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 did you see the uh, okay okay. So a couple of things. Uh, first thing is there is a a, a package uh, not not package. There is a, a website by uh, Delini. Like it's it's uh, uh, on. Uh, which has all the R packages for outlier detection. So I need to find it. Uh, uh, it's uh, it, it, it was on one of her GitHub uh, page. It was like CRAN task view, but it is on her GitHub page at that point. So it has it has a lot of packages for time series outlier detection as well. Um, so okay, so that that's that. But then then you're asking for time series outlier detection. So your, your problem is you've got a, a, a multivariate time series, and then your for then you're computing features of the multivariate time series, and then finding outliers in the feature space. Yes, yeah, so that is that is one way of approaching the problem. So you you transform it to a feature space and find it. But also there are these other methods which look at the outlier straight away, which look at the time series straight away and, and find, oh, this point is anomalous. Maybe like uh, Rob's, uh, Rob has a simple method in his uh, forecast package, uh, which must be uh, updated to Fable now. Uh, there, where he looks at uh, when when you uh, when you have the DC symbolized time series, I think uh, you see if your errors are uh, 
like too big or something like that, then you can call those phones less anomalies. And there are other packages as well, which look at time series outliers, uh, like not in a feature sense, looking at the straight raw time series and fitting a REMA models or wh whatever models, and then seeing at these errors, like all of a sudden, uh, or do we see massive deviations from what we would think we would get? So th that kind of, so there, there are two, I, I see two approaches, the feature-based approach, and then the, uh, the uh, raw time series approach. But of course, when you have a multivariate one, uh, multivariate time series, depending on the, uh, uh, depending on all the, uh, the co correlations between the different time series, that needs to be taken into account as well. But, but check out uh, ch check out Delaney's uh, GitHub page, which does have uh, a lot of. Uh, I, I will send it. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, I need to send it somehow. Yeah. Jill, thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul. Any other questions? Uh, I have a, a very general um, question. Um, so. If one of the method is um, dominant or obviously much better than others, if we have ensemble methods, would that actually um, kind of um, dilute the, the overall result, the outcome? So should we just try to get the, the, the most successful or accurate method? Um, why we use ensemble in case there are some poor performance one actually drag the performance down yes Jade, yeah yeah you we would think yeah of course that is very valid to point out so if we know that this method is really good much better than the others all the time then we don't need an ensemble because you know we have this winning methods that's fabulous that does wonders but often what we have is methods do well on on certain examples, but not on all examples, right? So, um, uh, like, so, like, uh, uh, so, so there are lots of examples where these ensemble methods have won prizes. Uh, like, for example, this Netflix prize, that was not by one dominating method all the time, but that was this ensemble, like complex ensemble learning. Uh, and then these uh, forecasting competitions that you know that are there, they have these ensembles uh, where depending on be, because essentially methods have uh, strengths and weaknesses and cannot perform well for all the different problems that are there. They can perform very well for a certain yeah. subset of problems. So by doing an ensemble, what we are trying is, uh, you, you know. Uh, I mean, this is one way of just one way of ensemble. But if you're actually applying it to a, to a competition or something like that, what you would want is you want to know where how your problem is doing, where where what where is your problem, and which method would fit it, or which ensemble is better suited for this method. Like you want to do this matchmaking kind of thing, uh, and and match it up. Right, so uh, and then fix an ensemble for your method, kind of that kind of thing, because uh, because when you take a broader uh, problem space, one method doesn't always do well. But if you know that your problem, a certain method does well, then you there's no need to use an ensemble. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That makes sense. And a, a, a quick follow up question is, I remember you mentioned in um, in comparing different um, methods in the ensemble, some of the methods uh, based on the algorithm will be kind of downplayed, those noises um, will be downplayed. So, so um, overall um, ensemble result will be um, will be uh, better performing. So does it mean in that process, you already review the labels so you can downplay those noises or, or the revealing of the label is at the, the very last stage, the, the algorithm will automatically downplay the, the noisy ones? So no, 
we, we don't look at the labels in any of this process. The whole process is uh, unsupervised. There is no labels whatsoever. So this is what happens. So here, when you get the latent trait parameters, these are the ensemble scores. They depend on, on these parameters. So the J's are the coming from the ensemble method. So alpha J is the discrimination of the ensemble method J. Beta J is the difficulty of the ensemble method J. And gamma J is the scaling parameter of the ensemble method J. And Zij J is the score that the, uh, the, that the method J gave to observation I. So, so suppose one, one method has very low discrimination, then if that method has very low discrimination, then that method uh, will, you know, that method scores will, will be weighted down. That's what I meant. So if a method oh, J has very high discrimination, that that uh, that alpha j will bring that that uh, that those zijs will be weighted up, right? So uh, methods with low discrimination will be weighted down. Methods with high discrimination will be weighted up, and that's how you get these ensemble scores. But we are not looking at the the labels. It's all unsupervised. It's the discrimination according to the fitted IRT model, which again doesn't look at the labels. And we don't need to um, train any of the hyperparameters, right? So they, these are all inbuilt in the ensemble. ensemble. Yes. So we don't need to do different uh, iterations to try so, to um, optimize it. So, so the the uh, the IRT uh, met the optimization process, it doesn't, uh, it's not like a neural net where you have lots of hyperparameters. It's, it's more, it's a more simple uh, one where, you know, you give this thing and then it'll uh, optimize that function that, that, you know, this is the uh, a function that will, it'll optimize and, and spew out these things. There are certain, uh, para there are certain priors that they use in this setting, which are uh, which they say, uh, you know, this is, we use such and such priors because they're more suitable, but those are the only ones that are there uh, in this, uh, uh, in this particular formulation. Uh, but it's, it's not like an neural net where you need to like, you know, tune lots of knobs. It is like a, a lot more straightforward process. I see. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, Sarish is um, has handed over to me. She has to leave. Um, I think there's just one more question from Fan Cheng, or potentially some more. <laughs> over to you, Fan. Thank you. Uh, hi, Sivandi. Nice talk. Mm. Uh, well, I have a question. So I also do anomaly detection in my research, and uh, well, it's kind of similar to Rob's uh, HDR CDE package. Well, the anomalies are found by the densities. So those with the lowest densities will be defined as anomalies. So I'm wondering in comparing different anomalies from different methods to calculate the densities. So now suppose I have two different ways of calculating the densities, the anomalies found will be different. So I'm wondering if there is a uh, way you have in mind to compare the um, anomalies from these two different methods. Mm. I don't know, fan just like that. But, but what I feel is this: I feel like uh, if you so because these densities, uh, of course, the due to the density computations, you, your anomalies are different. And then yep. uh, it, with, with each density computation. So if you have like, what if you have a data set that you know, right? Like like a normal mm -hmm. uh, data set and then some couple of anomalies far away, like a normal yep. log and with some anomalies far away. And then you try these two or more different methods and then you see which method uh, gives the anomalies as anomalies. Can you, is that? 
Uh, well, uh, well, in the simulation, I'm trying to have some predefined true anomalies, but in real data set, we don't know. But in order to test it, I do know. Um, so what we have now is to compare the rank of all the densities and maybe just the rank so we can do a correlation, calculate a correlation, but I'm thinking of a better way to visualize it. But yeah, just wondering if you have anything in mind. I don't know if I'm just like that, I cannot say, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Uh, because when, when we land to the point for anomaly detection, we can say, okay, this is the anomaly. But like, if you have more multiple anomalies, how would you talk to your audience saying that this is the, all the anomalies I found? And uh, I want to, if I'm going to compare, so I haven't think of a better way. Yeah, but never mind. Yeah, I'll have to think more. Yes. Yep. yep, sure. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks for the question. Are there any other questions from the audience? You can put it in the chat or unmute. No others? Everyone's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> As you <laughs> <laughs> well, did you want to close the meeting, Serge? Yeah, sure. I would like to thank you, Seb, Wendy. It was, um, it was a great talk. I loved the discussion afterwards. Um, so detailed and everyone was involved. So I think it was a great learning experience for everyone. Thanks, everyone who joined us tonight. And we look forward to see you next month in October. Thanks, Seb, Wendy. Thank you Thanks so, so much. much. Really, really, you know, I really enjoy it too.